Good morning and thank you for inviting me to present today. Uh, my name is Claire Shepherd. I'm the senior editor at ADIS Rapid Plus Journals, which are part of Springer Nature. I've been involved in scientific publishing for about 10 years and today I'm going to be talking about digital publishing. So I'm going to give a bit of a background um, around the transition from more traditional online publishing to more innovative digital features, give a few examples of the main options that are available and then talk about some of the main considerations and questions around these kind of features. So traditionally, when you think of a scientific article, you think of the static PDF. Now the move away from that has been fairly slow. Um, this is mainly because PDA, PDFs are well established, they're familiar, they're visually pleasing, you can use them offline, they're nice to print, and they offer a, a level of security and permanence as well. However, the scientific community have more and more content to read nowadays. Um, there's more and more content being published, partly due to things like the All Trials campaign, um, more and more online uh, open access content being available. So as well as having more and more content to read, they have less and less time to read it as well, with more constraints on their time in their professional lives. So this has changed the way that researchers are looking to, to get their content and their information. They're wanting to dip in and out of an article. They don't necessarily have the time to read pages and pages of a PDF. They want to get the key facts in as quick and easy way as possible. So this has led to increased interest in more innovative ways to display the data and actually disseminate their research. And as well as this, looking to broaden the reach, so not necessarily just looking to disseminate data to one particular group of physicians, but to other stakeholders like nurses and physicians uh, and patients as well. So alongside the changes in readers and researchers' habits, technology has also been changing. So more and more content is read via iPads and smart technologies with over 80% and I think closer to 90% now of doctors uh, using smartphones and apps every single day in their standard practice. As well as the types um, getting the content in different ways, it's across multiple different platforms as well. So there's the expectation that any content you want to access can be done on, an, on a smartphone, on an iPad or on a computer. So this is in our daily lives as well. If you, if you think of any news website, you'll, you'll see often a video or an animation alongside the text. It's becoming the norm to have this as a way of uh, disseminating information. And it's transitioning now into scientific publishing as well. Uh, the younger generation, digital natives coming through the ranks now, are used to this kind of uh, technology and this kind of way of accessing and disseminating information. So this is becoming the norm to people now as well. So what about publishers? We, as publishers, have to make sure that we're adapting to these rapidly changing environments and make sure we can keep up with what researchers and readers want. So there's great va variation at the moment among publishers. Uh, a few still use the PDF as their basis display, with many of the bigger publishers moving on to a more responsive design. Uh, at Springer Nature, we now have the HTML as the basis display, which is responsive across multiple platforms. And we find that still around a third of our readers will click through to view the PDF, but that suggests that two-thirds of readers perhaps do prefer something more engaging and more responsive. Some publishers are going even further, such as Elsevier's Article of the Future. This is where they have the PDF as a centre display, but down each side is a panel offering more innovative features like videos and animations alongside the article um, on the web page. So despite the variation, most publishers now do offer the capabilities to publish a range of digital features or digital supplementary content alongside the main article. So I'm going to go through some of the main examples. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but it's just some of the key things that are available and that are options uh, out there at the moment. So one of the main examples, video abstracts and educational videos. These are presentations delivered in video format. Usually the author of an article, talking through the key points, giving a background of why a study was done, what the key findings were, and what the main conclusions were. So it's meant to be a kind of teaser to the article. It's not the author just reading out the abstract, but something a bit more engaging and to entice the reader in and give them the key points um, without them necessarily having to read through um, a whole article straight away. It's meant to be a more visual and accessible way of explaining research and can be really helpful in explaining a complex topic in a more uh, easy to understand manner. It can also be used to di be directed at different stakeholders, so not necessarily just at physicians, but like I mentioned earlier, it could be directed at patients or anyone else who might have an interest or relevance in the particular type of content. Another type of video are surgical or practical videos. So these are videos demonstrating a particular procedure. So it might be a surgical technique, uh, the, 
the slide on the right, the picture on the right is a, a laser removal surgery. It might be administration of a product like a vaccine or it could be a video of a diagnostic test or procedure like an ECG that you can see on the left. And these are designed to be a visual way of displaying information, so something that can't necessarily be explained in text alone. Um, so again, to give the reader an easier understanding in a quicker, more accessible manner. Audio slides and slide sets, another example. So these are meant to be just like a real-life presentation, but delivered online. So they can either be slides, standalone slides, again, condensing some of the key points into a number of presentation slides, or there can be audio layered over the top as well, so the author talking through the slides as he presents. Um, and layering the audio is quite simple, you can do this in PowerPoint, you just need the computer, PowerPoint and a microphone. And it means that the authors may be able to reuse these slides in real life presentations. Summary slides, so this is something, um, at Aegis Rapid Plus we do this as standard with every article, uh, I know other publishers do something similar, uh, and also internal medicine do a one-page summary alongside an article. And this, again, is just a more condensed, simplified format of getting the key points of the, of the paper across. So uh, key points about why the study was carried out, what was learned from the study. It can be used for reviews and any other type of research as well. And again, just allowing the reader to get the key messages in a more simplified, concise manner. Animations, again, these can be used to help bring an article to life. So rather than just using a static figure, it can be a 2D or 3D animation and can really help to demonstrate complex things like a, like a product's mode of action, something that, again, you can't necessarily describe as easily with words alone. A few other examples um, are NEGM do a quick take video, which is a video alongside the article demonstrating the key findings in a visual format. Augmented reality is something else that's becoming more popular in, in the general world and also being now translated to scientific publishing as well. This is where you have an app, you just need an app on a, on a smartphone or device that you hold over um, either an image or a piece of text and it links out to other embedded information. So again, it's a way of including more information, more, more accessible visual digital information within a paper um, and like I said, all you need is an app to be able to link out to do that. Infographics are another quite common thing now. Um, it's a more, um, more visual way of displaying the data and, and make it a bit more accessible. Nature reviews have quite nice 2D and 3D animations. It's like an audio visual demonstration of a procedure or process. And Wiley do Smart Figures Lab, which is um, link outs from data and references to other relevant papers. So it makes it a bit more accessible to, for data discovery and reference linkage. So some of the main considerations and questions that, that we get asked about the digital features. Um, cost is obviously a big one. There may be costs to create a feature and some may be more expensive than others. If you're creating a complex video or mode of action, this might be more costly than, for example, doing uh, an audio slide or presentation. And there may also be costs to host the feature as well. It's worth checking whether additional approval is required. It may be that there are extra legal steps involved internally, as well as getting an article approved of getting a digital feature approved. Important to consider whether the feature is peer, uh, whether it's peer reviewed or not. So obviously this would help to ensure that it's fair and balanced, making sure that it reflects the content within the article and it's seen as educational rather than promotional. Timelines are something else to consider. Uh, it, it differs from journal to journal, so you may need to submit a feature alongside an article. It may be that you can submit it later on, but will this affect the publication timelines of the article? Worth checking. Um, where the features are hosted, are they easily accessible, are they findable and do they clearly link back to the article that they refer to? Copyright as well, uh, and there at ADIS we allow the client or the authors to retain the copyright because um, if, you know, if there's something they've created they may not want to give up the copyright but this may differ so something else that's worth considering. Checking whether relevant disclosures are displayed. So if a feature is found as a standalone item, it may be important to include the funding, any author conflicts of interest, and be as clearly transparent as you would be within an article itself. And whether metrics can be obtained. You may want to see return on investment, make sure that it's worth creating these things and what, what kind of people you're reaching as well. And um, So this is something worth checking as well. So these kind of things differ from publisher to publisher and from journal to journal. So it's just some of the main things that we get asked, so some things that you may want to consider if you're creating these features um, and check with the individual journal. 
Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, these are my contact details um, and please let me know if, if you have any further questions. Thank you.